Heavenly Father, it's only through your strength that we can even walk. We ask that you be with us, strengthen us, enlighten us. Help me to say the right words. Help the equipment to work. I thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Well, I'd like to start off a little bit to uh, say who I am. I'm De Quincey Yarnovic, so I go by the name of Quint, because it's nice and short. Um, I came from a family of very educated people, and my mom was even a teacher. My dad was the associate director of NASA. So we were really big into science, you know, the new math. We were going to uh, be highly educated. And uh, I, I grew up, of course, like everyone else, believing in evolution, because that's, that's just what we taught everywhere. You know, if you don't hear the other side, you're, you're not going to have any chance to believe the other side. And that anybody believed otherwise had to be an idiot. So uh, uh, my wife put up with me for a while uh, until I found a, a, a particular book. Someone uh, loaned me uh, by Robert Gentry, a, uh, a doctor from... We'll go into some of his material later. And it jolted me. And I started thinking, I better look into it. And pretty soon I was reading all kinds of stuff and watching videos, and gee, uh, I need to start talking about it. So here I am. Anyway, this is the first of a seven-part series called Evolution or Creation Seminar. This first session is uh, kind of an introduction to lay out sort of the groundwork for the battle. And let's get started. Amen. If I can uh, turn it on. Okay. It vibrates. This is sort of the last message to a dying world. The, three, well, the first of the three angels' messages from Revelation 14. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Here we have a judgment, our message, to worship the Creator. Now I want to give some special credit to some folk that have uh, provided information to me, even though they didn't necessarily know me. Uh, Dr. Kent Hovind, he's done some presentations, and I found them uh, interesting and fun. Uh, I even bought his slides at one point, uh, actually twice, uh, to help uh, get me started. Uh, I met Dr. Carl Baugh out at Glen Rose, Texas. He's a very gentle, wonderful guy. Has a great ministry going out there in Glen Rose, Texas. Uh, Dr. Walter Brown has written some good books I recommend. Uh, Dr. Michael Behe, he has a, a very good book. Uh, I met a Dr. E. Uh, Theo Agard out in Florida. And then Dr. R Robert Gentry, I mentioned he was the one that first started me thinking maybe there was another way to think. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. See, I want you to think about it. I don't want you to blindly go and believe what I have to say. I want you to think about all these things that are presented. Because if you blindly believe what you're told, you might blindly believe the wrong thing. Hello. George Patton once said, if everybody is thinking alike, then somebody isn't thinking. <laughs> so we have evolution or creation. To very different models. Now only one of these two is taught in our school system for years and years. And yet it's still in the newspaper. It was a, from an article. Evolution remains a timeless controversy. Some things never go out of style with the rise of an increasingly science and technology-based technology society. Scientific controversy remains a, dis a point of discussion. 
The concept of evolution, while now decades old debate, is a question that remains in the news today. You know, I was looking at this article and it had a couple of symbols there and I, I thought, gee, uh, this is, looks like a, an image and you could tell it's one of those worship images because, you know, they can desecrate it. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to look at a few different sciences. I don't know, evolution seems to have crept into a bunch of our sciences, uh, archaeology, astronomy, biology, geology, and, and more. But it's kind of funny. It's a little bit like a shell game. I don't know if you've seen the uh, shell game. They get some shells and they put a pea in one of the shells and they sh shuffle it around. You see, each of the sciences thinks the other science has the proof. It's, you know, they, oh yeah, they've got the proof. But there's no pea. There's no pea under any of them. There's no proof under any of them. Well, my seminar is in seven parts, as I mentioned earlier. We're, first, we're going to do the introduction. The next one I do uh, is going to be, how old is that rock anyway? And we'll look at some geology. And then the third session is dinosaurs. Uh, that's always a favorite. Then we'll have Darwin and Neo-Darwinism, where we'll look at the theory of Darwinism head on. We're going to look at the pillars of the Darwin theory. And in Dust, Dust Everywhere, we're going to look at the uh, astronomy and some of the aspects uh, around the Earth. We're going to look at Paradise Lost. We're going to look at what the world was like before the flood. See, we live in a junkyard. Things were a lot better before. Amen. And then in uh, session seven, we're going to look at the heart of creation. So why do I give a presentation like this? Well, I first want to show that creation science is scientific and that evolution is not scientific. Believing in creation is not stupid and name-calling is not very scientific either. <laughs> I want to validate the Bible, that belief in the Bible is okay. Some people have taken to, to calling these mythology and throwing away the beginning of the Bible and say it's all just kind of these nursery rhymes or something. But it's okay to believe your Bible. I want to introduce you to the Creator if you haven't met them, met Him. And I want to have a little bit of fun if that's all right. Now, I was the uh, fifth son and of uh, five boys uh, uh, and... When you're the fifth son, they tend to pick on you and, and rule over you. I don't know if how many of you can relate to that, but this story I can relate to completely, so I'm going to act like it's mine. And the, uh, here it's early in the morning, and I get downstairs, and there's one banana left, and I get it first. And uh, my older brothers are standing around, and they do not like it that the little kid in the family has gotten one over on them. So they're going to think up a way to outfox the little kid, right? So they say, well, you know, bananas are really just moldy spider legs. <laughs> and uh, you really don't want to eat a banana, do you? They're just moldy spider legs. Ooh. So here I'm... Uh, I'm thinking, I don't know, they're trying to pull one on me or what? Well, they got kind of smart here for a minute, you know. They said, well, we've got proof. So they took the banana and they cut it up and they pointed to the little spots and said, see, there's the spider legs. <laughs> and if it wasn't for that, I would have believed them. Right? I wouldn't have believed them, but I saw those spider legs and it was tough. Well, evidence is like that. You know, sometimes you think it, it's saying something, but we've got to be careful what the evidence is pointing to. Now, I believe in the Ten Commandments, and I believe... Whoa, where did I go? I believe that we should say the truth. Everything I present to you, I believe to be true. And I wish scientists would present to us everything they believe to be true. Sometimes I wonder. 
Some say evolution is scientific and creation is religious. Now, I admit there's some religious aspects of creation, but I believe it also has scientific validity. But one of the things we have to do, if, really, if we're going to call science, something scientific, what is the definition of science? Well, a leading evolutionist said, it is inherent in any definition of science that statements that cannot be checked by observation are not really about anything, or at least they are not scientific. Let me give you an example. I would say, oh, I saw these fish, and they gave birth to more fish. Or I saw this bird, and it gave birth to more birds. Or a cow gave birth to a cow. And the evolutionist comes along and says, yeah, I know that's what you see, but what did it used to be? You see? Now, true science is observable, repeatable, and refutable. Now, they get a little fuzzy on the refutable part because we start refuting it left and right, and they kind of do a wiggle and make it stay. So the evolution theory has been disproven numerous times, but they kind of try to wiggle around it. Now, I had my mother tell me that I don't like science. That's kind of hard to take. I like science. I love science. I wouldn't be able to do this presentation without this science that made this uh, technology that I'm using. So I looked at the branches of science, and I thought, well, which of these branches of science requires evolution to be true? None of them. We can have physics, chemistry, zoology, biology, human biology. You can have logic, you can have math, science. All these sciences you can have without evolution. And actually, evolution is really not a science, and we're going to get into that at a later point. But we have two great theories of the origins of man. Evolution or creation. Now, there is a third theory. I'm kind of hesitant to mention it. Well, all right, it's a theory that there's this, the world is kind of flat and there's this turtle under it. You all have heard this theory, right? Yeah? Okay, well, you ask them, well, what's under the turtle? And they say, well, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> so I want to look at each of the theories, evolution and creation, in, in, in a fast whirlwind manner, give you an overview of the theory. So first we'll start with evolution. In the evolution timeline, there was the Big Bang about 20 billion years ago. Now, I looked at Wikipedia, because this number has been changing around a bit, and they had 13.799. I kind of love the way they have decimal plates, you know, to get, like, they got it down accurately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, they say 20 billion years ago was the Big Bang. About 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth forms. About 3 billion years ago, we had life on Earth. And about three million years ago, man evolved, and today we have the space shuttle. <laughs> well, let's look a little bit at the, the, at the at the Big Bang. We start off with it's they you know they say there's it's re, it, well actually nothing at all actually and there, and there's no place to put it and there's no time to have it there. <laughs> but. This, this nothing explodes and you get everything. <laughs> now, how you can call that science, I don't know. It's, I didn't make it up. This is what they say. There, no one has observed anything anywhere near this concept, and they call it science. There's, there's nowhere ever anybody has ever had such an idea that uh, this is a scientific thing. Uh, it's just amazing. Well, and, and what you have is you have dust particles flying out away and somehow they gather together and they start with this nebula. This is like our solar system has starts with a nebula. And 
they wanted to get it to rotate, so they had this, there's a full of star nearby, blows up, and it somehow the shock wave makes our nebula start rotating, and then it flattens out. I don't know how that happened. And then it coalesced into different things, and the star lights up, and we have the planets. And uh, Now, the Earth, you know, it's, it's a bunch of dust that gathers out of the blank coldness of space, and it's molten somehow. <laughs> and uh, once this uh, planet starts uh, having volcanoes and stuff, the atmosphere forms. So we get an atmosphere, and then it starts raining on the rocks for millions and millions of years, and then we get this complex chemical soup. And it goes here, progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say it stopped. We, uh, we, we have some, uh, we're going to look at some evidence from some science studies that tried to figure out how to make life from non-life. And basically, those scientific um, experiments proved it was very difficult to do, so much so that it basically proved that it couldn't be done. <laughs> and they use it, and nobody does experiments in that area anymore because it's not very fruitful to look at that anymore because it doesn't look good. And then once you have one cell, you can start having other cells and you can evolve to all the different creatures we have today on the Earth. Okay, so that's the theory that we're looking at. Now let's go to creation. Creation says that about 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. About 4,400 years ago, there was Noah and a big flood. About 2,000 years ago, we had Jesus died on the cross for us, and today we have the space shuttle. <laughs> now, interestingly enough, the two theories agree in one place, at the space shuttle... However, since we no longer have the space shuttle, we don't agree at all. <laughs> now, some say, well, how come it has to be 6,000 years ago? Why couldn't it be 6 million years ago or 6 billion years ago? Well, in the Bible, we have some uh, 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 ages of the uh, patriarchs. And in there, we have Adam lived 130 years and had Seth. And he, uh, Seth lived 105 years and had Enos and, and whatnot on down to Noah. And then you follow the, tr the chart down a bit, you can get down to Joseph. And Joseph is a historical figure, and we have some idea when he would uh, have existed. Now, from our brother we had here earlier, maybe he can give us some better numbers on that. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. So, one interesting thing you can get from a chart like this is you can look and see that Adam lived uh, 56 years after Lamech, Noah's daddy, was born. So there was a, uh, a, a primary witness of Adam was Noah's father. So Noah could have got information secondhand about Adam. So I, I, I just point that out. I thought that was interesting. Now I could ask a, a question. Who is the oldest descendant of Adam? Now, it's a little bit of a trick question because everybody says it's got to be Methuselah at 969 years. Well, he's the oldest dead descendant. And Enoch is the, not dead yet, so he's still counting. So I don't know when he had his last birthday. But he's uh, at least 5,300 years old. So we have 6,000 years or 20 billion years. Clearly, only one of these can be right. And I'm here to show you which one. Amen. O Timothy, keep that which is co uh, committed to thy trust, avoiding vain and uh, profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. 1 Timothy 6.20 Now, there are those uh, well-meaning folks who have tried to reconcile the two theories. They've tried to say, well, let's not let the Bible get left behind by science and we'll stick all that years back in the Bible. So we'll figure out a way that we can add all these years in the Bible. And there's a couple of theories 
that look at that. And I, I think we have to approach that. I think it's totally unnecessary. But we need to look at the theories to see if there's any problems with the theories. First, I'm going to start with the gap theory. In 1814, Thomas Chalmers invented the theory. He made it up. All right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth in Genesis 1.1. And then he said there's this big gap of time. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. So he stuck all this time in there where the time of the dinosaurs and all kinds of stuff could have happened and created the fossil record. Well, let's look at some problems with that theory. First of all, in Genesis 1, 4, 10, 12, 18, 21, 25, 31, God says it's good, 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 very good. And I don't know how good it is if we have death going on. And then we had in Romans 5, 12 and 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, it says death came by sin. The problem with his Chalmers theory is you have to have death already happening for a million years before Adam and Eve ever came along. Then there's the day-age theory. This theory is that each of the days of creation were long ages of time, you know, perhaps millions of years. And they use these verses, a, a thousand years is as yesterday, Psalm 90, verse 4, and a thousand years is like a day, 2 Peter 3, 8. Well, first of all, it says a thousand years, not a million years or a billion years. And secondly, you, uh, you have uh, in... Genesis 1, 9 through 13, you have God made the trees and the grass. And on the fourth day, you have the sun, moon, and stars. So it's kind of hard on the trees and the grass to wait a million years for the sun to come up. <laughs> and of course, you still have death before sin. Now, another popular one is uh, theistic evolution. The idea here is that God guided evolution. So that fixes all the problems evolution has, because God fixed it. Well, here we have Pope Benedict with Stephen Hawking, basically showing that the Catholic Church has no problem with evolution. We think it's wonderful. Now, of course, we have the problems of death before sin, but we have another problem. We have male and female... Here we have in red the words of Jesus. It says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. And you can also find that in Matthew 19.4. You see, the theory of evolution says we started out with single cells with no male or female. So, uh, is the Catholic Church saying Jesus is wrong? Hmm. See, they're trying to reconcile with science and thinking themselves wise, they become fools. You know, uh, it's, it reminds me of some churches that want to, uh, they want to make them like the world to get the world in the church. And I, I think what they've done is just destroyed the church. Yes. You know, if you try to reconcile evolutionary science, which is man's opinion to God's perfect word, guess which one gets changed? So you might ask, why do you even bother with a theory in the first place? Why have a theory? You know, science uses theories to help them predict things. This is a good thing. They also help them to understand the world around them. Now, I can't think of two theories that have more impact on your understanding of the world around you than evolution and creation. They provide a basis for scientific testing to test to see if the theory is correct. Now, I have a theory. I, I think it's a wonderful theory. You all like to hear my theory? Well, uh, starting with some facts, we have about 50 to 200 billion stars 
uh, no, 50 to 200 billion galaxies, and each galaxy has about 500 billion stars. Now, my theory is that every one of those stars has planets around them, and every one of those planets has humans on them, and every human on every one of those planets looks just like me. <laughs> you like that theory? <laughs> What's wrong with that theory, besides it's kind of egotistical? Uh, you can't prove it. You can't test it. And if we remember what the G.G. Simpson said, it is inherent in any definition of science. That statements that cannot be checked by observation are not really about anything, or at least they're not science. Well, I could say mine was more like science fiction, or my wife might say horror. <laughs> now, it's true that the Bible has been misrepresented to saying things it didn't say. For instance, the sun revolving around the earth. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. And we have a place where people think the earth is flat because it says the four corners of the earth. Now, we use the four corners in, a, in when we have a compass. We say the four compass points. And it's still valid to use that terminology because it's pretty big earth. And there's actually a, a verse that kind of leads you to believe the earth might not be flat. It's, uh, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 40, verse 22. We've also had church abuses that have come along to squash science. A prime example is what happened to Galileo. Although I think kind of the opposite is happening now. Now we have science wanting to squash religion. Hmm. Now there is some science in the Bible that is uh, probably ahead of its time, I would say. Uh, here Job, one of the oldest books in the Bible, says that nothing holds the earth in place. Nothing underneath. Oh, where'd he come from? <laughs> and uh, in Proverbs, it says, the fountains of the deep... Now, we didn't realize there were fountains in the deep until 1976. Now, the ark has the dimensions of six to one, length to breadth, and all of our current modern uh, <clears throat> ocean-going vessels are in the six to one ratio. It's a very stable ocean-going ship length, so how did they know about that length way back in Genesis? Hmm. And in Revelation 21:21, 21, 21, it talks about the streets being of pure gold, clear gold. Clear gold. You know, only modern metallurgists understand that most metals, if they're extremely pure, are clear. Hmm. How did they know that? His going forth is from the end of the heavens, his circuit to its ends. There is nothing hidden from its heat. This really sounds to me like a description of background radiation that modern astronomers have discovered. And here, David spoke about it well before uh, Jesus' time. Now, I want to take a, a whirlwind pass at some of the major areas of proof between evolution and creation. So I'm going to start with some scientific laws. The first law of, of th uh, thermodynamics is no matter or energy can be created or destroyed. Well, I guess the Big Bang blew that one. Let's see, they created a little bit of matter and a little bit of energy. How about all the matter and all the energy created at once? Well, you know what they say is, well, back then the laws didn't apply. <laughs> well, that's a convenient time. Do we ever know any time when the laws haven't applied? That's another one of they made up. 
The laws didn't apply. They probably make that up in religion too. Uh, they get a uh, they get less organized. Things get less organized. They decay and they get old. That's the second law of thermodynamics. Basically, it says, uh, well, example, you go to bed and you wake up the next day and your hair is more more combed than it was before you went to bed. No, it's more disorganized. That's that's the law. Of entropy. We have enthalpy, the first one, and entropy, the second one. So things tend to get less organized. Except evolution, the whole path of evolution is more organization. It's against the laws of science that we're taught. Now we'll look at some more of this in some later sessions. We also have biologic complexity. See, they're believing that this... uh, that evolution is all random chance events. But some things are so complex, there's just just no way they can happen by chance. And here we have bacterial flagellum. They have a propeller on the back end to move around, and that's a, a 20 nanometer tube they have sticking out the back. And this tube spins at 6,000 to 17,000 RPMs. Now, it's a bioelectric motor, and it's microscopic. We would love to have this technology. I mean, can you just imagine being able to put something in a little thing and have it swim on up wherever you want it to go because you've got a, a bioelectric motor that's this small? Wow. You know, a general car would cruise at about maybe 3,000 RPM. If it went to 17,000 RPM, you'd probably be a motor blow up. Wow, this is impressive technology. Now, I went out to the Department of Energy website. I know you all go there all the time. (laughs) And I saw this drawing of a machine on their website. I thought, gee, I've seen that picture before. It looks like bacterial flagellum. Well, we also have uh, some evidence about the age of the Earth. Uh, If the Earth was young, there wouldn't be time for evolution. Because they need eons and eons of time, and it has to be so big that our mind can't comprehend it so we can believe it. Okay. Uh, So I'll go over the young Earth stuff a little more in... Uh, session two uh, called How Old Is That Rock Anyway? and Geology and on session five on Dust, Dust Everywhere, kind of an astronomy look. Well, let's look a couple of quick ones for uh, young Earth. First of all, the temperature of the Earth is too high. You know, they like to start it as a molten planet and it's cooling off. Well, if you've been cooling off for four billion years... How do you have magma so close to the surface? Hmm, makes you wonder. We have oil underground at high pressure, and yet that pressure never bleeds off unless we stick a pipe in it. We have a Grand Canyon with steep edges. They're not rounded off nice and round. We have the Mississippi Delta. You know, it's a pretty good-sized delta on the Mississippi. You know, it's a muddy river that brings all kinds of debris out there, and the delta keeps growing. Well, how come it isn't filled in the Gulf of Mexico? And speaking about sediments, how come the ocean isn't filled with sediments? We go down to the ocean bottom, and there's some sediments down there, but it's not very thick. And yet, in 150 million, 150 million years, you can erode the uh, land masses flat entirely. 150 million years. Hmm. Well, we have geologic formations, and like I said, in the next session, we'll be looking at some of those geologic formations uh, that I believe lead you to believe in the flood. And there's some predictions that the theory of evolution has. And we're going to look at at Darwin and his theory in session four quite a bit more. But there's a prediction that evolution has that a Japanese trawler in 1977 off of New Christchurch, New Zealand would never see one of these. 
This is a plesiosaur. And plesiosaurs, well, needless to say, they lived millions of years ago, according to evolutionists. Now, they dispute this, but the uh, Japanese, in their 100-year anniversary stamp, they believed it was a plesiosaur. We also have flood evidences, and we're going to look at some of that in uh, session six on Paradise Lost. We have uparts, out-of-place artifacts, uparts. Now, they're out of place if you believe in, in evolution, but they're right where they should be if you believe in uh, uh, creation. So let's go look at an upart. This bell was found inside a lump of coal in 1944. Needless to say, that would be a problem for evolution. Because they date coal at from 290 to 354 million years ago. Now, there was no man around about that time, so you'd have to say this was an alien. <clears throat> actually, it's funny, they have actually started talking about uh, biologic life coming from other planets because they're seeing problems with having it starting here and we're not having enough time or there's problems. So that's part of that theory wiggling to try to make it stay. And we have Bible evidence. Now the Bible says that the creation happened 6,000 years ago, roughly. So if there's prophecy in the Bible, which is predicting the future, that can't be done except for by God, then it is a proof of the validity of the Bible. We're going to look a little bit of prophecy in session 7 on the heart of creation, and we also have design. Like I mentioned, the bacterial flagellum. It, this, we see design in a lot of places, and we're going to look at some of that in the last session. Here's one of them. The uh, Fibonacci numbers, or the golden spiral. Uh, this is an interesting pattern that is shown in a variety of places. In one place is in quarks. at the smallest level. Thanks, Russell. So the next session, we're going to look at uh, how old is that rock anyway? We're going to look at geologic evidence, the dating methods, geologic column, and index fossils. So I hope you can make it for that. If you could bow your heads for a minute. Heavenly Father, we thank you for creating us. We thank you for inspiring us. We thank you for saving us. In Yeshua's name, amen. Amen.